I will start this week by reviewing the loss to the Bulldogs. We went down by 14 points on Saturday. It was probably similar to the Essendon game in round two where we sort of left thinking, was it one that got away or was it a brave loss? How do you sit about that performance? It's a tough one. I think it's probably, it is similar to the Essendon game, but that was definitely one we let slip. Mm. This one's a bit more complicated. I it, think in hindsight, it was probably one we were in the game, mm. but not necessarily should have won. Like the Bulldogs sprayed so many chances. Yeah. They had 33 scoring shots to 23, and they won a lot of the key indicators. And you just felt like they were going to run away with it at some stage. But considering how well we did to get back in the game in that second quarter, get in front um, during the third quarter, it was a really brave effort and mm. it would have been great to have pinched the win. But it just shows we're on the right track. But, yeah, I don't think we're right up to the standard of those teams yet. And Bulldogs obviously had so much to play for as well. So yeah. I think the 14-point result's pretty fair in the end. So like mm. We're right in the game up until the end. And probably this six-day turnaround coming back from Perth, that's always going to hurt the young group. Yep. But, yeah, uh, it was a difficult one, but... I think, yeah, it's probably just reward in the end. I think you're spot on in the terms of it was probably more of a brave loss. I mean, at the time, I was ropeable because you think of like, you know, Walker yeah. Walker missing his dribble shot, Hipwood yeah. running back and dropping a mark and uh-huh. all the sort of transition plays that we fluffed, particularly in the first quarter. Um, at the time, I thought it was one that we definitely ballsed up. But oh, I was the same. When, yeah, I think when you sort of walk away and get a bit more composure and, you know, Think about it a bit more carefully. Yeah, as you said, the Bulldogs sprayed a lot of shots. We only had like 37, I think, inside 50s, and they just mm-hmm. dominated out of the clearances. And Yeah, look, we, it was a brave loss, but it was doesn't make it any less frustrating that we could have got one. Um, I suppose the first question to come out of that game was, do you think the coaching staff was vindicated in how they rested players for the trip to Perth? So that was McStay, uh, McLuggage, Berry, and Hipwood. Um, I don't know if they were vindicated. Like, they were okay, but at the same time, they probably looked a bit flat as well, most of the guys, yeah, probably I think coming they, off a week off. I, I think they lost think... a bit of touch, actually. I think Hip, yeah. Hipwood, probably the main culprit in terms of his... He sets a high standard, but it was probably his most ordinary game of the year. He got a lot of the ball, but yeah, it just looked a bit sloppy. Fumbly. And that's very and, unlike him. Yeah. And McCluggage wasn't, I don't know, he wasn't really up and about. And Barry was pretty solid. Like, it can't Barry hit. had a good game. Yeah. yeah. He did a good goal. Mm. But um, I think I think long term it'll be vindicated. We'll see this weekend yep. against the Gold Coast and a game mm-hmm. we actually start favourites for. And then even yep. Melbourne the following week seemed pretty gettable. And then North to finish the season. Which um, is very gettable. Very gettable. Might decide the spoon. We'll talk about that, no doubt, in the future. I think, personally, when I reflect on the game, what was most impressive for me was the fact it wasn't the senior players, our star players, and it wasn't the youngsters that drove it. It was the sort of in-between, like Ryan Bastanak was terrific, Josh Walker was amazing, and Daniel mm-hmm. Rich was probably best on ground. Now, he probably fits into the you know senior star player, but... He has been maligned, and he does fit alongside Walker and Bastinat in when it comes to copping a bit of scrutiny. Yeah, he does. Yeah, Daniel Rich has come along, I, I think we spoke about last week, just with Witherden coming into the site. I think yeah. Rich has really played some of his best footy since Witherden has come in, and that's just been a masterstroke, and it's really freed him up. And mm-hmm. That was one of the best games he's played this season, and probably for the last few seasons as well, which mm-hmm. kicked a couple of really good goals and got plenty of the footy, kicking it more often than handballing. I think he's on the right track and, yeah. I nothing better than hitting, whip. seeing him hit a sweet goal from outside oh, 50. Nothing better at all. It's an absolute mm. glorious sight. And, yeah, with Josh Walker, he's one of those guys that was probably playing for his career a bit this season. He's one mm. of those guys that isn't a star, but he's brought up here to add a bit of experience to the side. But, He's played a really good role since he's come back in the side, and you can play at either end of the ground. But yeah, he's, he's looking really positive. And Bastanak as well. He keeps on 
defying the doubters. I know at the start of the year, people had written him off mm. and saying, oh, why did we even bring him up here? It was a mistake. We should have just let him go and, and that sort of stuff. But he's played some great footy and really good finisher as well. Kicked a, kicked a couple of goals. So you know, he's, almost, he's on he's, the right track. He's almost, he always pops up. Yeah. He's almost automatic in front of goal at the moment. He's like Steve he Nash at the free throw line. You just yeah. ATM. You don't even think about it. It's remarkable how far he's come. And as I said, like... He was so out of form at the start of the year, but the consistency he's got in his game at the moment is terrific. And he was definitely one of the driving forces in the comeback in the second and third quarters. But um, yeah, and that goal in the last quarter as well, great snap around the corner. Yeah, I think I read an interview with him a while back. He's just really enjoying his footy up mm. in Queensland. Yeah, he I know said what you're even about. when he was dropped, he didn't sulk and, and moan and. And carry on too much like he said he would have at North, and mm. he just took it in his stride. And obviously that attitude's paid off because he's come back in the side and, and played some great footy. And mm. he doesn't look like dropping out of the side at the moment. You'd be very unlucky to yeah, to go out of the side in the near future. So he's playing some really good footy. He's playing very well. Um, before we move on to talking about the Gold Coast this weekend, there are a few noteworthy pieces that came up in the media this week. Um, very <clears throat> so. There's been an ongoing rumour for a long time about Charlie Cameron, but it was reported for the first time on Fox Footy by Jake Nile last week that Brisbane and possibly Charlie Cameron pushing from his side of the things a move to Brisbane at the end of the year. Um, he is contracted for next year as well, so it's not as as easy as being an uncontracted player. But, yeah, what do you think about potentially adding Charlie Cameron to the mix yeah, this room has been going around for a while, and when I first heard it, I was just like, yeah, it would be obviously great to have mm. at the club, but what do we give up for him? That's the thing, because yeah. I think he's one of those players, like, he's the cream in a really good side like Adelaide. He's mm. superb. You can break the lines. He has so much speed. He can kick a goal, but I think in a more developing side, he might not have the, the same effect and might get lost a bit, but... Mm. If we can get him at the right price, obviously we're going to take him. Yeah. But it's just what we have to give up, and Adelaide's not going to give him up without a fight. getting a lot of compensation. Yeah. So I think the going rate would be something around a second rate pick. And as it stands at the moment, our second round pick is actually pick 18 with draft penalties to GWS kicking in. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know if that's a, that's a fair starting point, but. Yeah, they'd probably want more for him than that. But mm. potentially, we've obviously got Port Adelaide's first pick. Yeah. And that could potentially come into it. And we can hopefully keep death riding Port Adelaide because. Yeah, great we result hate them. on the weekend. Terrific result. I've hated them since day dot and mm. continue to hate them now. So it was a great result. See Adelaide absolutely touch them up on the weekend and obviously great for. For us, if they can keep slipping down a ladder a bit. I think what complicates a potential deal for Charlie Cameron is where Connor Ballenden fits in with in terms of the draft bidding. Yeah. He yep. seems to be somewhere around that, you know, port pick, which could be fourteen, fifteen to the Lions second pick, which could be eighteen. So it's gonna you know, the list management team, Dom Ambrosio and David Noble got their got their work cut out for them, but just on the rumour in general, there's you know, you, there's this, this saying, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's a lot of smoke about this. and Oh, yeah. I think it'll be one that we will continuously hear till the end of the year. Um, the other notable media piece from the week was Alistair Lynch in the Courier Mail writing an open letter to Jared McVeigh, basically courting his services on the Sam Mitchell playing then assistant coaching role. Um, we've spoken about it with Mike Whiting, the potential, the possibility yeah. of Luke Hodge doing that, and we did mention actually Jared McVeigh's name at the time. Um, so, how do you feel yeah. about McVeigh Lions matchup? Yeah, he obviously has a ton of experience, and mm. it's looking like it might be his last year. And with the Swans, they're always looking to transition the side that just never seems to go down the ladder but mm. yeah I think to have someone 
with that ilk. He's played in two premierships. Has been such a successful successful club mm. for a long time. So, oh, I think he'd be brilliant. Come in for a year and then transition into um, an assistant coaching role. And uh, by all reports, he's a great leader as well. So I think he would have no problem in going into an assistant coach role. And like we spoke about with Mike, like how important those leaders were in the early years of GWS. Yeah. And you just see where they are now compared to Gold Coast, which just went out for the best players possible now for mm. Gary Ablett, who is a obviously a legendary player, but his leadership skills probably aren't up to scratch with um, some of those other guys GWS brought in for a year or two, and mm. they they were basically playing assistant um, coaches. And Sam field, Mitchell's yeah. done something similar this year, and I think if we can get someone like McVay or even Hodge still holding out hope for him, like... Mm. That'd be brilliant. Um, McVay himself is actually playing really good footy as well. Like he started the year with a few injury problems and probably started slowly, but the last few weeks he's been terrific. I think the interesting thing from a Sydney point of view is, you know, all the talks about how they're bursting at the seams with the salary cap when they've gone and re-signed Zach Jones and, as of tonight, Sam Reid. So there's someone that's going to be pushed out, and is it going to be Jared McVeigh due to his age, potentially? But we'll wait and see. Another one to follow in the off season. I thought it was going to be a quiet off season for us, with you know Shacky re-signing and a few others re-signing. But we might be, might still be active on that front. Yes, we might be. Um, moving on to the more. I guess we'll read the the nearer future. We've got Gold Coast this weekend in a game we'll start favourites for. Gold Coast, terribly out of form. I think they've lost four or five straight in the last month. Yeah, they don't look like winning at the moment, which is good and a bad thing, I guess. <laughs> They're probably for us. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think, well, I guess we, I don't think we've started favourites at all this year. Maybe the Carlton game. No, I think Carlton was still probably yeah, slight I... favourites in that one. So, yeah, I don't think at all this season we would have started favourites. So do you think there's a danger of, I don't know, becoming complacent and, you know, expectation getting the better of a young team? Oh, you would hope not. Mm. Maybe expectation, but complacency, oh, no way. Mm. Oh, if complacency creeps in, that would be indictment on the, the playing group and probably the coaching group as well. Like most of those guys that have been there for a few years now know <laughs> wins do not come easy mm. in this competition. Rockcliffe, Beams, Rich, some of those more experienced guys have been around for a long time, haven't played in a lot of wins. So they know what it takes and yeah, hopefully there is absolutely no complacency at all. But yeah, we've had a decent record over the Gold Coast even the last few years when they've probably – been better than us throughout the season, but mm. I think I think we win this game. Like yeah. our form is a lot better than theirs, and the go- the feeling on the Gold Coast is Rodney Ed's gone, and there's probably a few players will go with him, and there's going to be a big clean out of that footy club. So I think probably morale's pretty low, and compared to at the Gabba, I think morale's pretty high. Yeah, I, likewise, this is a game I'm actually not too worried about, which is a weird feeling when you're on the bottom of the ladder, thinking, you know, things are looking pretty good this weekend, we don't have to worry too much about the boys, but I don't know, it just goes to show, I guess, the Gold Coast form, and but also our form, like our post-buy footy's been really good. Oh, really good. So, there are at least, well, there's at least one change we'll have to make with Cedric Cox, injured an ankle on the weekend, not sure how serious yeah. Alex Witherden's hamstring is if that was just a cramp or what the story with that is but yeah it would seem that Cedric Cox will probably miss out um would you would you drop anyone from the Bulldogs game uh Shaki obviously had a, a really down game but mm. I think you just got to persist with him he's been copying a lot on Social media, I just can't understand it either. It's not we, good. We see it with these really high draft picks, especially young forwards, that are always going to take time to develop and mm. have a few bad games and the fans just get stuck into them, which is just... I thought that would have stopped now that he's re-signed. But maybe we expected him to 
play a bit better since he re-signed. The, the pressure came off. But, mm. yeah, I think it's pretty disappointing that fans would turn on a, a kid like that. He's, he's going to be an absolute star. We're just going to give him a bit of time. And him in a, a good side is going to be a really dangerous prospect. Mm. It's almost cliche that to say tools take time, but they really do. And They you do. Know, the, you know, the proof's in the pudding when they come along. But um, Yeah, you look at Joe Danaher now, just coming good. He's probably in his fifth year of footy and he's mm, he's killing. only coming good now, really, in the last couple of years. So, the thing, Shaki's in his second year. The thing that probably doesn't help Shaki, and from a, certainly from a fan point of view, is you compare him to Eric Hipwood, same draft class, and a fan can go, all right, yeah. Eric's doing this, this, and this. Why can't yeah. Josh do that, that, and that? So... He's probably a bit of a victim of his own teammate, but um, yeah, there was, there were certainly right. some moments on the weekend where his hair tearing, especially when he kicked into the man on the mark when we're on a fast break up the wing and you know making our charge in the fourth quarter. But um, anyway, I'm I'm like you, I th- I think he'll come good eventually, but I'm not sure how best to manage it. If you build him up through the knee fall, you just sort of keep him in the ones and back him in. I'm really not sure. I'm not sure how things sit with Michael Close either because he's been tearing up the kneeful. I watched the game on the weekend and he was terrific. But yeah. he doesn't seem in favour. Like he came in for that West no. Coast game and went straight out, even though he was pretty good <laughs> over there. But um, Yeah, he's probably just um, a victim of us having a lot of tools to choose from, which is mm-hmm. a good thing. Skinner went straight out even though he had a great game against... West Coast, which is a bit surprising, but, mm. yeah. Um, we'll wrap up this week's episode with another question. Thanks to everyone that contributed to the last question, which was really well received. A lot of good responses as well. Like, you and I were pretty comprehensive in our Dane Beams pick, but there was responses all over the place. There was a, a Josh Walker, Eric Hipwood, Bastnack, which... yeah. Week after week is starting to look like a better bet. There was a Rockcliffe in there. Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, someone said um, Tommy Cutler, actually. That was an interesting one. Yeah, interesting one. Um, but this week we're going to talk about the best individual game you remember from a Lions player. Yeah, there's a few, and we have to go back a long way for this. But the one that immediately comes to mind is Jonathan Brown, 2005 against Essendon at, it probably wasn't called Eddie had, it was probably called Telstrodrome back then, but mm. he came back after getting suspended in the 2004 grand final, first game back, did not miss a beat, mm. came in and kicked eight goals, absolutely tore up, and that was just Jay Brown in his absolute prime. Essendon could do nothing that night. We'd been really struggling early in that season as well, coming okay, off the, yeah. the grand final loss, and we've lost... Few players to retirement. Black was Solomon Black was suspended as well. But yeah, that night I was there in the stands. It was absolutely incredible. So eight goals and it's always better when you're Jono there Brown. as well. Oh yeah. Um, like you, Jono was the first name that came to my mind for that performance and his ten goal match against Carlson. I think that was two thousand seven. Two thousand seven, yeah. At the Gabba, but then I just thought deeper about it and I'll start with some more recent games that were pretty memorable in my mind was Josh Drummond against the Eagles when he kicked three goals in the pandemonium at the Gabba, the James yep. Polkinghorn Torp. And it was a game, 2012 it was, the last game of the season, Daniel Rich kicked four goals and had about 25 touches against the Bullies. Yeah, that was a good one. And then, that was just memorable for me because obviously Rich, you know, I love a goal from outside 50 and for him to just, you know, run rampant and kick four and also deliver a few lace out to John O'Brown that day was pretty memorable. But I think also shout out to Simon Black's 03 grand final. Yeah, I was about to mention that. Mm, but I, I'm i going to go with, I think it was 2005, Jason Ackermanis in the way yeah, yep. against Geelong when he kicked those two freakish goals <laughs> from the pocket. I think he kicked five for the game that day and had about... Yeah. Twenty five thirty, um, yeah that that was just otherworldly. It was incredible. That was in, absolutely incredible. And yeah, go back to the two thousand three grand final. Everyone remembers Simon Black and 
deservedly so because mm. he was incredible that day. But Acker that day as well, yeah, five he goals. Five, yeah. He was kicking goals from everywhere, and I mm. think like most other grand finals, he probably gets the, the Norm Smith that day. But Black was just that good. Thirty nine possessions in a in a grand final it doesn't get much better than that. But think- there's a few other games that stand out. Michael Voss, I think, might have been. 2003 semi final, yeah, it was 2003 semi final against Adelaide. He wasn't supposed to play, his knee was absolutely shot. Is that when he played forward? Uh, no, he played a bit forward. No, the, the semi final, he was still playing in the midfield, but his mm. knee, he had to get so much rehab on it, and he was playing off one leg, but just carried us over the line. It was absolutely incredible. And I think a lot of people were riding us off after that. Mm. Qualifying final loss against Collingwood, we're all banged up, and Voss comes out and not supposed to play and, and just dominates and pushes us through. Yeah, I must admit, after that 03 qualifying final, I thought it might, the dream run oh, was yeah. over. <laughs> but um, yeah. no, it, what a great grand final that turned out to be. Um, yeah, so some good, good picks there. We'll be interested to see what sort of feedback we get this week, but. I think, you know, when you look back at the, the glory years, we've definitely been sport for choice when it comes to this sort of thing. So, And even before that, we'd love to hear of, you know, past life experiences, going back to the Bears and Fitzroy. Yeah, Bears and Fitzroy, <clears throat> yeah. Mm. Anyway, mate, that's all for this week. I'll talk to you next time. Thanks, guys.